Meenakshi, the floor is yours. Dr. Meenakshi, uh, sorry. So thank you, Shama. I think thanks for waking everyone up. I hope I don't put them back on the sleep um, and try my best to keep them engaged. And, and thanks to the two previous speakers, you have actually made some very pertinent points, which I was going to make in my presentation as well. So I think I'll, um, I'll skip some points which have been quite well made already um, and spend some time on, on discussing um, on the questions which have been raised. So as, uh, as Shama alluded, I'm going to talk a little bit more about experience of Australia and more specifically Melbourne uh, to drought because just like India, Australia, in Australia also water is a state issue um, and we struggle with managing water between the borders. So our, uh, our basins don't identify the boundaries between states, but of course the governing agencies do. So that's a, that's a common challenge between India and Australia. So what I'm going to do today is um, run through these four main headings, traditional urban water management. I don't think I need to spend too much time. And the key challenges, um, spend a bit of time on IUWM and where does desalination fit in? Uh, Dr. Meenakshi, we are all people who are not very knowledgeable on this so please this is our opportunity for it's an opportunity for us to learn so sure go ahead. all right thank you thank you so traditional urban water management um, this is pretty straightforward that we have been using very linear system uh, we get the rainfall we have the runoff we collect as much as we possibly can and rest floods our cities and um then we use that water which we have collected in our reservoirs to treat, provide to households, industry, agriculture. We collect the wastewater, treat and dispose. So we have been wasting these two streams, basically. We consider them as waste. Um, and the key objectives, of course, have been that we want to provide reliable drinking water supply, keep the wastewater away from our water supply so that we don't have cross-contamination. And with the stormwater, the objective has been take it away from the city as soon as possible so that we don't get flooding. And of course, the traditional system has done all these three um, boxes. They have been ticked very, very well. The problem, though, is uh, this system puts very little consideration for the ecosystem health. What is going to happen to the receiving waterway where we are dumping our wastewater, treated or untreated? The same with the stormwater, which carries all the contaminants from the catchment. And it doesn't, of course, address the climate change vulnerability or city growth. Population is growing, uh, but rainfall is not proportionately. And on the top of that, the rainfall is not uniformly distributed. So Australia has very variable rainfall. And you know about India, all the rainfall um, gets out in, in three or four months during the monsoon. So what do you do for the rest of the year unless you have huge storages uh, which can be kept for dry months? So the key challenge is population growth. I just said that I'm not going to spend too much time here. So we need um, high quality water to supply and water security is linked to energy and food security as well. So just like India, Australia relies a lot on producing their energy from coal um, based thermal power plants which are very water hungry and food security, of course, we can't feed the growing population without having enough water. Oh, that's not how it was supposed to pan out. Um, just bear with me. I'll take this away. So the other major challenge, of course, is the urbanization. Um, nearly 70% of world's population is expected to live in the cities. Um, in, in India, that number is small, but for a country like Australia, 90% of population already lives in city. So we have growing demand at a very concentrated space. Um, and of course, supply is finite. And it brings problems like um, peak flows after the, after the rain. I think most of you would have seen this figure the green line actually here shows the amount of runoff that will be generated in a 
undeveloped site. So if the site is forested, as soon as the rain starts to happen, on x-axis, it's showing time. On y-axis, it's showing the runoff volume. So a lot of water actually infiltrates into the soil. It will recharge the groundwater and also provide the base flows to the rivers for summer. And only after the rain um, continues for a while, you'll start to see surface runoff, which, which goes directly into the streams. But the blue line here is showing uh, what happens in the urbanized catchment where most of the pervious spaces have been replaced by uh, buildings or roads and concrete pavement. So very little space left for groundwater infiltration and very flashy peaks of stormwater runoff, which means it brings a lot more um, flow into the rivers. And because it's running at high velocity, it brings all the contamination as well. Um, and then the other problem is, of course, um, increasing temperatures and reducing precipitation predictions for future. So this is a case study for Australia, but um, look at the results. They are not dissimilar for India as well. So the top figure here shows um, three scenarios, low emissions, medium emissions, and high emissions. And Australia, of course, it's in the high emission at the moment. We are trying to move towards medium. But even with the low emission, which is going to take substantial effort, by 2050 and 2070, we are seeing increased temperatures. And the bottom figure is showing the change in precipitation. And all these yellows, oranges, and red colors mean reduction in precipitation. So they, we are going to see increasing temperatures and reducing rainfall. And climate variability also means that we are seeing lots of, <clears throat> lots of floods um, at one place and drought at other place. Sometimes in the country, these two events happen at the same time. <clears throat> so one state is experiencing drought and another one is experiencing flood. And, and these, some of these pictures are from India and some are from Australia. So they share those problems uh, really well. They are all the same problems. And uh, this graph here actually shows the water inflow in Perth dams, Western Australia dams over the century or the reservoirs, you can say. So we were just hearing that we rely so much on rainfall and collecting that water in reservoirs. Um, the x-axis shows timeline from 1911 to 2011 and x-axis is y-axis is showing um, the amount of water which gets into those reservoirs in gigaliters which is 10 days to 9. So if you focus your attention on the green line here it shows between 1911 and 1975 the average amount of water which we collected in the reservoir was 338 gigaliters. There were interannual variabilities, but that's the average. Look at next 25 years between 75 to 2000, that amount reduced to 177, so almost half. And um, Jay mentioned about the millennium drought we had, it reduced to 92 gigaliters, um, and in the further year, 75 gigaliters. And after 2011, drought broke, and we actually started to see um, a bit of um, uh, increased in flows, but that is the story. But it tells a very uh, dire story, actually. And in terms of water management, what does it mean is the traditional rainfall runoff data is not a good predictor. Because in Australia, Bureau of Meteorology actually collects very good data. And we did have a bit of discussion in the previous talk about uh, consolidating data and everything. So Australia has gone through national water reform through a lot of hard work and frustrations of bringing 200 agencies together to kind of mine the data and refine it and unify it. But after having done that, Australia has been quite proud uh, that we have very good data collection and Bureau has almost 100 years of records. But the previous graph actually tells us it's useless for future water management because we just can't use it to predict what's going to happen in future. Um, and climate variability is going to mean that we are going to see more severe floods and droughts in future. So we heard that in the previous presentation as well, that we need to have adaptive response. And that adaptive response needs to be able to respond to climate change. 
or be climate independent basically so that it doesn't rely on the rainfall for water supply it has the ability to capture water when it's available and it's available in oversupply so that we can avoid the flooding and utilize the diverse portfolio of water sources to meet the fit for purpose demand i kind of color this these keywords because fit for purpose is very important we really don't need drinking water to flush our toilets or irrigate our lawns so we actually can provide fit for purpose water and that is the key and it has to be environmentally sustainable as well we, we can't just think of securing water supply and keep dumping our waste water into the same river which is the source of our water supply so we need to have a holistic approach and think about our water supply our storm water management and our waste water management as one single system so the overall challenge is how do we provide adequate and by adequate i mean which is safe reliable and resilient water service and protection from floods and droughts to our growing cities uh, which are subjected to population growth climate variability and climate change and we want to do this all in environmentally sustainable and cost effective manner if cost was not an issue we will all go for desalination but we just don't have unlimited supply um, of resources so emerging solution iwm has been mentioned before but i say that we need to consider water supply wastewater stormwater and groundwater together and focus on meeting fit for purpose demand instead of supplying one quality of water for everything and it of course aims to minimize the impact on natural environment maximize the contribution to the economic uh, vitality and overall community improvement and produce less waste and um, the key to that is we have heard that that we reuse wastewater for drinking or non drinking purpose we make best use of storm water and we have desalinated water the question though is um, which one we should use and in which sequence and to that i'm going to talk very quickly about australia's response to climate change uh um, in australian uh, major centers all the cities there is strong focus on implementing stormwater reuse and recycled wastewater where possible but as jess said all the five major cities in australia now have a desalination plant and perth has two because they have very little um surface water supply and they rely a lot on groundwater which is now depleting um so desalination plants do provide capacity to supply increased demand without impacting the fresh water resources but it is the most intensive and uh, most energy intensive and costly to build and run even if you don't need water and australia actually has experienced that that even if you don't need any water from desal plant you need to keep the system running otherwise your membranes are going to die out so it's expensive just to run and what got us into desalination while we have been looking at other options as well so that i'll take you to melbourne's response so melbourne's annual water demand is around 400 to 450 gigaliters and we had a 13 year long drought which lasted from 97 to 2009 um if the reservoirs are full the melbourne has large reservoirs enough to supply four years of demand so it's around 1800 gigaliters but the reservoir level fell to less than 30% because the drought was really very long so the government waited until 2004 but because rains were not coming back and reservoir levels were falling two large infrastructure projects were initiated the desalination plant uh, with capacity to supply one third of melbourne supply 150 gigaliters and the other one was in north south pipeline because we heard agriculture is the biggest user there are a lot of inefficiencies there as well so a pipeline was built um, to bring some water from the agriculture district to the city so that we can meet the city demands but while these projects were initiated they take they take long time to actually get on the ground and get started so there was a very uh, big push on the demand management and awareness campaigns so there were lots of different uh, options adopted to to make public aware of the situation like displaying water levels on the billboards as you travel down the road 
um, lot of media um, campaigning, and there was a target of 155 liters per person uh, per day use. There were several stages of water use restrictions, and the most strict ones actually um, restricted any use of drinking water into lawns or gardens. Rainwater harvesting through subsidies. So now we have 30% households with rainwater tanks because government provided subsidies to put that and efficient appliances like dual flush toilets, efficient shower heads and water ratings for dishwashers and cloth washers. So as you see the last two, these are the permanent water savings. Even after drought, we are kind of reaping the benefits of reduced water demand through those two. And the results were dramatic. Through those demand management uh, campaigns alone, we could reduce 40% demand um, through residential and industrial water conservation programs. Plus there was a reduction in the environmental release of water to the streams because some of the streams are managed here, first meet the uh, city demands and then release the leftover water. So there was some reduction there. Um, and there was a target to achieve 20% reuse of wastewater to support the agriculture. And that was achieved at that time too. Water pricing was not used as a mechanism during the drought to bring the um, demand down. And I already made the point that some of that um, reduction in demand is permanent. And Millennium Drought basically provided Melbourne with the opportunity to develop and implement a more integrated approach to water management, which is generally not possible. So it was basically use a disaster as an opportunity. And we went from 247 liters per person per day use to 149 liters per person per day. So we kind of beat the target of 155. And this graph here shows um, the dark blue line shows the water levels in the reservoir of Melbourne if we did no demand management. And the light blue actually shows the actual water levels <clears throat> because we did put the demand management measures in place. So this is a bit blurry, but it shows June 2007, water levels came down, would have come down to 10 to 15% if we were doing the demand management. And maybe by June 2009, Melbourne would have run out of water at all because our desalination plant was still not ready. So what happened to the desalination plant and North South pipeline? They, both these projects um, came in operation only in 2012. And by that time, we started to have uh, heavy rains. We didn't use any of these two. So since then, we have been just maintaining uh, the Victorians have been paying desalination levi on top of their water bills because it's, you need to keep the membranes running. Um, so desalination plant has been sitting idle from 2012 to 2018. And only last year or so when we started to have low rains, instead of waiting for reservoirs to fall too low, we started to use some of the desalination. So uh, the lessons learned is one is the diversification and fit for purpose water use is the key. We used recycled water for agriculture and we also use the recycled waters uh, for non-drinking uses at household. So any new development which came uh, between um, 2006 to now is now plumbed with three pipes, not just two. So one pipe bringing in portable water supply, drinking water supply, another one taking the wastewater out and the third one bringing in recycled water, which is fit for non portable uses. It gets plumbed to toilets, laundry, and the garden. So we started making all those uses. The other important point here is that it ensures reliable supply under variable climatic conditions, but it also breaks the pollution cycle. More wastewater we can use, more stormwater we can capture, you are saving your rivers from the pollution as well as from, from flooding. <clears throat> so I think the lessons are that we go back to our um, old fashioned three R's, reduce the demand, public awareness, efficient appliances, et cetera. But wastage through non-revenue water is a very big one, uh, especially for a uh, country like India. 
I do have two PhD students working um, on two different cities of of India, and leakages are up to fifty percent. So desalination can be a solution, but if we are prepared to put uh, resources in building the diesel plant and also committed to um, run them at such high cost, generally, generally the argument is it's not easy to fix leakages and recover that non-revenue water. But if we are considering it against desalination, maybe it will make sense. So perhaps we should be looking at uh, low-hanging fruits first. Um, and that then the reuse identify all available sources, rainwater and stormwater, of course, and gray water. And I will strongly say that we should not see our wastewater as a waste anymore. This is the water which is available every day, just like desalination. And on the next slide, I'll actually make case that this is actually a better source and more available source than even desalination. So is desalination the answer? I would say not always. Other sources might provide cheaper alternative and provide other benefits as well, because if you, if you capture stormwater, you avoid the flooding as well. If you capture wastewater, it helps with the pollution issue, which is again a big problem. Um, desalination provides additional source in the coastal cities if other avenues have been explored, but it's not an option for inland cities. You don't have sea everywhere. Like for Australia, we have sea next to every city, but for a, for a country like India, we can't desalinate everywhere. So we really need to think of other options. The other problem is it only tackles water availability issue. You can bring water from desalination, but flooding issue will still remain. Waterways will still remain polluted. And the question someone asked in the previous uh, presentation about the waste from desalination, uh, waste disposal is a big problem. It's, it's very, very salty. So you are actually concentrating the salt from seawater. It, it, at the moment, we have no other solution than just dumping it back into the sea, but you can't just dump it close to where you are taking your feed water. So it has to be piped well inside the sea. So 10 to 20 kilometers in, depending on the marine life and everything else and the, and the local regulatory requirements. So the wastewater needs to be taken back deep into the sea for disposal. Um, and still, we don't know what kind of um, adversities we'll see in the future. So just to summarize those main points, so demand management can be very useful. Um, it's important to understand and use demand if we want to supply fit for purpose um, water and community participation and environmental sustainability should be the key determinants. So environmental sustainability is important from pollution point of view, but community participation is important as soon as you start to bring in recycled water, even for non portable use. And desalination, in my opinion, should be part of the mix, but not the first choice. And here I have a little video uh, which summarizes uh, some of those uh, options I have been talking. If we have two minutes, Shama, how are we going with time? Let's, let's play it because uh, I do want to play it. Then yeah. we will have a discussion. Okay, I'm going to sure. invite some people. Thank you. Yeah. And at the end, I have just put in a list of some relevant papers if people are interested. Thank you so much. We will put it up. Dr. Minakshi, we cannot see the video. I think you have to share your screen again with. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. If it just doesn't work, then we will on. go to the we will go to the discussion immediately. While she is doing it, I just want to thank Dr. Meenakshi because it has been a very comprehensive introduction to us, uh, people like us uh, from UNU Merit who are social scientists to understand the different uh, implications. And uh, my uh, question to the discussants, you know, Dr. Uh, Amita Basu and um, Anurag mentioned also Dr. Bhattacharya is really how do we... Um, I'll just finish. I'll, I'll, we'll see the... Uh, can see can the, you see the slide now? Yes, we can. We can. We can. So let's, uh, let's see the video. But we can't hear anything, Dr. Minakshi, but we can see. 
Oh, okay. If you want, you send it on the chat. Uh, Jairaj taught me how to share it with uh, sound. He will do it. Or we can uh, see sure. it later okay. because we are running short of time. Do you mind, Dr. Meenakshi? I have I have left the link in my presentation so you can share it later. Okay, thank you. So, so please, it actually summarizes uh, it summarizes all other options than desalination. I I just talked about and um, and what benefits it can provide. So it's a nice little video. In fact, I think I I like all the presentations so much. This idea of giving the video as a little challenge competition for future interns would be great or anybody i think it's very very informative so uh, i would uh, i would just like to ask uh, dr basu and dr bhattacharya to to react to these presentations ask any questions and in particular i am interested I was very fascinated by australia how it mixed community engagement with you know looking for the right technological options along with building legitimacy through data sharing so uh, you know it was a very interesting uh, dynamic that led to the good solution so i want to know how can is this replicable elsewhere what do you think mr basu uh, can you hear me please yes we can you can also okay. ask any questions you want Okay. Yeah. Now, first, I must thank all of you for an excellent presentation by each one of the three speakers, and also the introduction given by you, Madam Sharma. My take after the presentation is after these presentations is that desalinization is definitely an option, but for a country like India and similar other developing countries. can we think of desalinization as a first or a preferred option unless it is a compelled situation like in the sea coast of tamil nadu or elsewhere because the rest of the country or majority of the country there is no water shortage per se but there is lack of proper water management and that is what my first take is my second take is that when we talk and if i have heard dr minakshi correct that she said that desalinization is more appropriate in the coastal areas than in the inland cities a recent problem that we are facing under an asian development bank funded or assisted rural water supply program there is salinity in a district in west bengal called east midnapur it is not near the coastal area so whether we should go for a desalinization or whether some other source options should be explored is an issue which we are still you know uh, struggling to find out the other is a point which you very validly mentioned that when we talk of this water source security apart from these various options because in desalinization there is a question of cost whether india can afford if we want to go for a cost recovery mode b the environmental impact which desalinization methodologies have then what will it have in the long term effect and third the evolution that it is happening in the technology having said all that what is most important and i agree with you dr sharma is involvement of the community participation of the people is important if i remember my days in rajasthan which is an arid area there was a system which was a traditional system of storage of rain water and there was a system of the community monitoring the water supply and restoring it can we use this traditional so says or we just throw it away as something which is obsolete because if we look today whether it is in andhra pradesh whether it is in rajasthan or madhya pradesh 
when we come to the water source, when we come to the distribution of water, the tail enders, be it in the irrigation front or be it in the city like Varanasi who are at the end after the you know, downstream consumers, they don't get the safe drinking or safe irrigation water. So community participation becomes important and that is where water users association or various users association needs to be built up, which is an exercise being carried out maybe as a model to start with in some parts where this Asian development project is uh, happening. But I will not elaborate further because time is short. Once we have the panel discussion, we can explain that in more detail. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now I've unmuted. Okay, so your points were very, very valid. Thank you. Uh, I want to say two things. One, unconnected to what you said, and then I'm going to ask our panelists to respond to you. Uh, one unconnected is uh, many people are writing interesting comments. I ask you to write your comments saying who you are at the end, and we will be happy to tweet all this on your behalf to during the day to the relevant uh, water authorities, to UN Water, for example. So please write down whatever you feel. Now, uh, Dr. Meenakshi, Jairaj, and Raja, do you want to say anything? Do you want to add anything to what uh, Dr. Basu has said? Go uh, ahead. I can, I can start. Um, mm. So thanks, um, thanks, Dr. Basu. You have raised some very good points. Um, I'll respond to two of them and then pass on to the other speakers, perhaps. Uh, the first one you said about um, issue with the high salinity in inland area, um, and should we be desalinating that or not? So <clears throat> absolutely, because desalination is generally used for seawater desalination. Um, and if we are using it for highly saline groundwater or for industrial treatment, we generally call it membrane treatment, just, just to differentiate. So when I say desalination is not put in inland um, cities, it's mainly for des uh, seawater desalination. I have been involved in a project um, in my early days in India uh, when I was researching at IIT Delhi. Uh, and um, it's a it, it's quite suitable to use membranes for a for saline groundwater, for example. You still have the issue of uh, disposing your wastewater, but it's not as saline as the desali uh, desalination byproduct from seawater. Um, there are other other options available as well, but perhaps a membrane based process run at very high recovery for saline groundwater is a good solution, um, I would say. And the second question around uh, rainwater harvesting, um, you are absolutely right. We have actually dumped our previous traditional rainwater systems uh, and moved on to the, uh, to the pipe supply, but uh, rainwater harvesting at any scale is beneficial. If people can do it at household level, it can be directly used for um, for drinking or cooking um, if, if the tanks are managed properly. Um, and at communal level, it can provide a good source for non-drinking uses as well as agriculture. Um, so in Australia, as I was mentioning to you, there has been a big push and 30% households now own a rainwater tank. So they collect water from their rooftop and use it for non-portable uses because there is no treatment attached to each one of those. So absolutely, it's a way to go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Shama, does anyone want to say something? Yeah, yeah, I want to add one point uh, for Mr. Basu's benefit. So in the next session, there will be some uh, uh, illustrative companies, some companies who are sharing their experience in large-scale desalination and some companies which are sharing experience in what they are saying as small-scale desalination, including, they say, for uh, brackish water. Now, whether it's tried, not tried, that in, in the Indian context, that's a different situation. In Jairaj's uh, uh, you know, research, we also came across some material which we will share with you, 
where on an experimental basis, IITs on the one hand have uh, come out with some proof of concept. Let's put it that way, because what happened next was not clear. And that was focused in Rajasthan, I think, or was it Tamil Nadu, I forget. And similarly, MIT had also done, we'll share both those uh, uh, you know, details uh, 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 with you. Right. Oh, my you. only, yeah. My last comment is this, which is, I mean, I don't have a solution. I also agree we should go into all the other sources before desalination, but it still doesn't answer two questions. One is why hasn't desalination? I mean, we are looking at desalination technology as it stands. Why aren't we improving? In our case, if we are facing such a huge crisis, then we need maybe a little bit of everything. That was uh, the thought. Why isn't it improve, I mean, uh, happening in the pace we want? And number two, what happens in case of the risk of political economy? We're not able to manage the pollution to our uh, river and surface water sources from industry, as well as uh, household sewage, not being treated and just being dumped. Supposing that takes a much longer time to uh, you know, solve. That is a, a risk. That was the uh, concerns. Of course, we should attend to those areas, but what is the view on that? Yeah, Mr. Would you like me to respond yeah. to that? Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I, I actually, I briefly touched on that one. So non-revenue water and untreated wastewater getting into our streams, uh, they are perhaps two quite untapped opportunities. And I hear you saying that uh, it might take us a while to put up the sewage treatment plants and solve this problem. So uh, instead of focusing on that, um, can we actually go and fix the water supply problem through desalination and then come back to it? So my, my, uh, my suggestion or my view on that is that we should perhaps go and bite the bullet as it is, because if we ignore the wastewater treatment problem, um, it's not going to go away. And, and while we are on to man, uh, securing water supply, this is the best nudge required that we solve water security problem as well as wastewater treatment problem as well. Because if we went ahead with desalination, uh, we will still be producing wastewater. We will keep putting that untreated wastewater into our rivers, which means because supply is now coming from sea, we don't really have any incentive to manage our river water quality at all. And it is going to be a problem which never gets tackled. The other problem is we still will have the issues around flooding and everything else um, untackled. And, and with seawater, we will create another waste stream of brine. I'm, I'm not against desalination. Uh, I'm just saying that we perhaps should be taking a holistic view instead of uh, parking all the problems we have and then try to find a, a separate solution. A very brief one on your other question around why the cost of desalination hasn't come down. It has actually, if you look at it and compare the cost in last 20 years, it has come down tremendously, but it's still quite high when you compare with everything else. 